This morning we're moving through the book of Acts, and um, you can join me in chapter 2 today. Last week we focused on one of the major themes in Acts, which is God is on mission. This week and next week it's going to be the Holy Spirit is moving, the moving of the Holy Spirit. What we gather from the Bible is that Jesus' mission is not to just rescue people and simply take them from the world, but to join us in the world by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to spend the next couple weeks talking about what the Holy Spirit is up to. Uh, what it means for us to be a family who is formed and shaped and led by the supernatural empowerment of God the Holy Spirit. So let me try to establish some context before we jump in to Acts chapter 2. Who is, the whole, who is God the Holy Spirit? I want to draw from some language that uh, Tim Mackey used. I don't know if some of you might know Tim. His videos are on, uh, online, uh, um, bibleproject.com. Uh, super solid and helpful content on there. Uh, and he uses uh, one of his videos, and he talks about the Holy Spirit. So uh, some of this comes from him. According to the Bible, the story of the Holy Spirit starts on page one. The uncreated world is, is portrayed as a dark and chaotic place, and God the Holy Spirit uh, is there with the Father and with the Son, and he's ready to bring about life and order and beauty. God's Spirit is how the Old Testament writers would talk about God's personal presence, uh, the Hebrew word is ruach, and, and it's a word that we translate as breath or wind, energy, vitality. So some of the things that, that makes, brings to mind is the Holy Spirit is powerful and invisible. He's the creator and sustainer of everything that's alive, right? And so throughout the Old Testament, we see God draw near to his covenant people, uh, the people that he chose to I- initiate this, his rescue plan with and made promises to. Despite their uh, unworthiness, despite their rebellion, his personal presence goes with them in the tabernacle and eventually in the temple. We see the Spirit of God enlightening and convicting and bringing them to believe his covenant promises, but we also see the Holy Spirit empowering people for specific times and seasons for specific tasks. Like, for example, Joseph is enabled by the Spirit of God to understand and interpret dreams. Uh, Bezalel and Aholiab, they're enabled by God, with, by the Holy Spirit, with artistic wisdom and skills and creative genius to make things beautiful in the tabernacle. Kings like Saul and David, we see judges like Gideon and Samson, empowered by the Holy Spirit to guide and sustain the lives of the people that God had entered into covenant with. The prophets are empowered by the Holy Spirit to see things that are happening in the world and often in the future from God's point of view, and they're enabled to communicate and often record God's infallible truth for the people of God. These Old Testament prophets, they understood the problem of our world and of history. They understood that God had created a world, uh, his temple, so to speak, that was very good untainted by the curse of sin, and his personal presence was with us in a beautiful way, in a beautiful and powerful way. They understood, the prophets understood that because of our rebellion and our refusal to glorify and to be satisfied in God, humanity had forfeited the right to enjoy the power and the vitality of God's personal presence in a way that it was in the beginning. You see, because of the curse of sin, You and I and everyone that we love enters into this world spiritually dead. You and I and everyone that we love have participated in unleashing hell on earth, so to speak. We've we've brought chaos and corruption and darkness into this world in our relationships and through all of creation, God's temple. The prophets foretold a day when the Spirit of God would come in a powerful new way to restore what's been broken this time into the dark, chaotic world that our sin has brought to be. The Holy Spirit would come to bring about life and order and beauty once again by transforming the hearts of men and women and by empowering them to truly glorify and be satisfied in God. Well, this new move of God's Spirit was promised and promised and promised in centuries past. God the Son, Jesus, is being baptized in the Jordan River and the sky opens up and the Spirit comes to rest upon Jesus, and he begins to reveal that he is the true temple. He is God's personal presence in creation. God, the Holy Spirit, empowers Jesus, and he begins to reveal the essence of the new creation. He starts to give glimpses, foretastes of what it will be like when the Holy Spirit restores life and order and beauty in full. That's what people mean by heaven, by the way. And so you see Jesus begin to like forgive sin and reveal the glory of God, and you see him 
heal and create life where there was once death. You see him give up his life to satisfy God's wrath for our sin and to tear down that that wall of hostility between humanity and God. According to the New Testament writers, the early eyewitnesses, it was through the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus was raised to life again and his resurrection is the beginning of new creation life. Well, what happens next is Pentecost. God's presence shows up again and he begins to, power, or to pour out his spirit and transform the hearts of his people and enable them to become part of this new creation, to enable them to find their satisfaction in him. That's what's about to happen in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to read it this morning. The disciples of Jesus themselves are the first of us who have become the new temple where the personal presence of God will reside in order that we might be continually, continuously empowered and transformed by the power of God, the grace of God, and that we might take the good news to the ends of the earth. Let's check this out together. If you have a Bible this morning... Or a device, you can join me at Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Some of you love really practical uh, messages. This Sunday is not that, okay? This Sunday is meaty, theological. There's lots going on between the Old Testament and New Testament part of the Bible. And sometimes we've got to like put our brain on and think about some things because it'll help us to see God more clearly, okay? So that's what this is. This, this isn't going to be, here's five ways to go out and be a better husband, okay? All right? So if you are trying, if you, you miss on some of the things that we're talking about today, that's what small group's for. Go ask them what the heck Josh was talking about. I have no idea, all right? Okay? But we're in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1, okay? When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Now, I got to tell you about Pentecost, okay? Um, If you weren't with us the last two weeks, we studied chapter 1, and we learned that after Jesus rose from the grave... He spent like 40 days with his uh, disciples teaching them about, you know, what God's up to and what it means to follow him, right? He ascends to heaven and he tells them to go back to the city and wait. So Pentecost means 50th. And it was observed 50 days after Passover, which if you remember was when the weekend Jesus died and rose. They were celebrating, all the Jews were celebrating Passover, right? And so 50 days later, here they are. It's been 10 days since Jesus left. And, and, and the disciples have, have been gathering. There's 120 of them. They've gathered. They've been waiting and praying in Jerusalem for something to happen. Pentecost was originally celebrated in the Old Testament as one of the seven feasts, festivals, that God gave to the descendants of Abraham. There were seven appointed times throughout the year that God asked his people to meet with him. And these feasts, they mark God's people as his people. And they gave them opportunities to remember what he did and thank him for rescuing them out of Egypt, for making promises to them that they didn't deserve, for bringing them into the promised land, right? And so ultimately these feasts were shadows of the reality that Jesus would finally come to accomplish. And so, for example, at Passover they celebrated uh, uh, the blood of spotless lambs, right, that spared their ancestors from the angel of death as God delivered them out of Egypt. And yet it was pointing to the promised one, Jesus, the Lamb of God, whose blood would take away the sin of the world and would deliver them from God's wrath, right? That's what Passover was pointing to, the, the feast of first fruits. It was pointing to the resurrection of Jesus. How, you say, what, first fruits? Well, it was just like the harvest, and you harvest the first crops, then it gave them an opportunity to thank God and to trust that there was going to be more to come. Well, Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits of many, It is the promise and the guarantee that there's more to come. That's a good thing, right? Amen? Right? Okay, so they celebrated, right? And so this feast, Pentecost, at Pentecost, 50 days after Passover, it's also known to the Jewish people as Shavuot, and it was the Feast of Weeks. And so you can read about it in Leviticus 23, uh, Deuteronomy 16 talks about it. From all over the land, what would happen is, Uh, throughout their history, Jews would travel to Jerusalem and they would recount the stories of God's grace and his promises and the way that he provided for them and brought them into the land. And they would bring the first fruits of the harvest, the wheat harvest, to the temple. And they would rejoice in the harvest and they'd celebrate and party with their family and friends. And it was an awesome time. Over time, Shavuot took on a new character for the Jews because, you see, the very first Shavuot was calculated to be the exact same day that God came down to give the law, his covenant, and his promises, his commandments, to Israel at Mount Sinai, okay? Mount Sinai, when God came down, that was 50 days after the very first Passover. And so by the time of Jesus, Pentecost had become this celebration for the anniversary of God coming down on the mountain 
right? Now, if you haven't heard about that yet, like at Mount Sinai, God's personal presence came down to meet with his people that day. They were freaking out. They said, Moses, you go. Uh, don't want none of that. In smoke and fire and thunder, right? Remember that? Exodus 19. Now, here we are again in Acts chapter 2, and this is crazy because it's 50 days after Passover, and the city of Jerusalem's like all swolled up. All the people are gathered. There's usually 30,000 people on the streets. Now there's hundreds of thousands of people in Jerusalem, and here's 120 Jewish men and women gathered in an upper room, and once again, the Lord comes down to meet with his people. And during this feast where there's, you know, when God's people were celebrating the harvest, there's this beautiful significance that, that the Holy Spirit is poured out to empower his people for a harvest. When God came down on Mount Sinai, while Moses was on the mountain, if you remember, God's people reject him and they worship a golden calf. Exodus 32 tells us that when, God, when Moses came down off the mountain, 3,000 people were put to death that day in judgment, right? Remember that? Okay, well, this time, according to Luke, when these people come down from this upper room, 3,000 people are spared from the judgment because they receive the gospel and they're harvested for the kingdom. They're given eternal life and they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit that they might actually t carry this good news uh, back as missionaries all over the world. God is recreating the events of Mount Sinai in a new way, okay? Acts 2 is something special and unique is happening. Check this out, verse 2. Suddenly, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each of them. Now keep this in mind. Luke is attempting to describe a supernatural miraculous event. And it's why he's using words like. Like, right? Like flames of fire. Like that of a violent rushing wind. He's trying to articulate something supernatural that he's never seen happen before. Okay? Remember the word spirit is the same as the word wind in both the Hebrew and the Greek. It doesn't say they felt the wind. It says they heard the sound like that of a violent rushing wind. Kind of sounds like thunder, right? And something like fire appears over their heads. Again, all throughout the Bible, fire is a symbol of God's presence. The burning bush, the pillar of fire, the, the fire on the mountain. The, there are stories of God, of the, in the Old Testament of God's fiery presence filling the tabernacle and the temple. And so here we see God is recreating the events of Mount Sinai in a new way. And here's what we should understand about this. He's not replacing what he did in the past. He's not coming along and saying, ah, that, that was a mess, I got a new plan. God has been working his plan from the beginning, and he's not replacing the Torah or replacing the law or replacing the old covenant. What's actually happening is another picture he's giving them that, that the hopes of the Jewish people and the hopes of the prophets, I'm fulfilling it today in a remarkable new way. This is amazing. Instead of writing the law on tablets, I'm doing what Ezekiel 36, what he promised Ezekiel 36, I'm writing the law on people's hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the prophets declared that God's promise would come. And he promised that he would come to live by his spirit in a new temple and establish a new kingdom. And what Luke is telling us here is that God's new covenant temple is the family of God. It's the family of God. In other words, where God lives, you want to say, hey, where does God live? Where's God at work right now? Where is God moving? Where do you meet with God? His personal presence, where is it? It's the people of God. It's where they gather. It's not a building. It's God, the Holy Spirit, is present in people all over this earth, and he's brought what's been spiritually dead to life, and this is how it started. This is how it started. Verse 4. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded and amazed, saying, look, aren't all these people who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea, in Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia... Phrygia and Pamphylia, e I practiced this a long time, by the way, yeah. <laughs> Egypt and those parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own tongues. 
they were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, well, what does this mean? Some sneered and said, they're drunk on new wine. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit is poured out on these first followers of Jesus in the middle of Pentecost fest, and they're empowered to speak in known languages that they didn't know before. And they end up going out to where the crowd is gathered. That would have been helpful in college, by the way, if I would have had that gift <laughs> uh, to learn Spanish, by the way. And, and they end up going out to where the crowd had gathered, and they begin to praise God, right? They, they explain the gospel. They tell the stories of what God has done for their people through Jesus. And this crowd of people gathered from all over the known world, they understand them in their own languages. And what we learn right off the bat is that God is declaring that his Holy Spirit has been poured out for a reason. The Holy Spirit is poured out to empower his church to accomplish the mission. Do you remember what the mission was? We read about it, I think, last week, Acts 1, 8, the week before. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And immediately God has overcome the barriers of language and location. In other words, God has declared again that the gospel is for everyone and the mission is to take the invitation to all nations. And as we get on mission, he'll do what it takes to accomplish his plan. Amen. Okay? Verse 4 says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Last week, we read uh, that Jesus said in Acts 1 verse 5 that you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. Okay? Is there a difference or is that just a matter of semantics? Well, both of that can be true. John writes in his gospel that the Holy Spirit will be in you. Luke writes in his gospel that you will be clothed with power from on high. So is there a difference between having the Holy Spirit in us and being clothed with power? Yeah. Now the view that I'm about to give you is not, only, not the only orthodox view. In other words, you don't have to hold this view to be part of this church family. But I am increasingly persuaded that this view is correct and that it's desperately needed in the church. I believe that the language of baptism is connected to identification. Okay? When you're baptized in water, you are choosing to identify yourself with Jesus. That's what you're doing. You're saying, I love him. He's awesome. He loves me when I didn't deserve it. I'm in. Right? And so it's expressing publicly that you are united with him in his death and his, re his new resurrection life. Similarly, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit is the act that God does where he identifies you with Jesus spiritually and unites you to him forever by the Holy Spirit who indwells you as you turn from your sin and express your faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? It's, if, if, you, if you confess your sin to God, if you actually see yourself for who you are before him and you can agree with him about that and you believe that Jesus is who he says that he is. And if you have that conversation with God, you confess and you believe, you're born again, the Bible says. That's what he's talking about. It's what it means. The Holy Spirit opened your eyes to see the truth about Jesus, and now he indwells you. And guess what? You have all the Holy Spirit. You have the same access to him that every single follower of Jesus Christ has. There's no varsity or junior varsity level in God's family. Okay? We're baptized by God in the Holy Spirit at the moment of conversion. Now, are there exceptions to that? Yep. Apparently there are. If you read your Bible, um, there seem to be a few exceptions in the book of Acts. And we'll see, we'll take them as they come over the next several weeks, months. But if, exception number one is right here today. These first Jewish believers in Jesus, they were believers in Jesus. In John 14, Jesus promised these guys that the Holy Spirit would come to indwell them. In John 16, he says, hey, they're like, why are you leaving, Jesus? You're, oh, don't leave. Oh, what are you going to do? He's like, hey, I got to go. It's for your benefit that I go away because if I don't go away, then the counselor, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. How clear is that? That's John 16. If I go, I will send him to you, he says to them. Now, so Jesus tells these guys he had to leave and and, and be exalted before he would send the Holy Spirit. So apparently he had this whole timing thing going on with the Pentecost thing, right? Pretty big deal, right? And, and, he, and he had this, this launch of the church was the dawn of a new age and a new movement of God, the Holy Spirit. And so, yeah, it was a big deal. And if you want to be semantical about it, these very first Jewish believers, they believed in Jesus prior, and yet they were baptized in the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. 
and they were filled or empowered by the Holy Spirit in that moment for immediate, extraordinary ability to carry out the mission that God invited them to carry out. Okay? They were baptized and they were filled. Now, I believe the scriptures teach that the essence of being filled with the Holy Spirit is when a person who's already a believer receives extraordinary spiritual power to overcome their sinful nature and to grow to be more like Jesus or to carry out the gospel mission in ways that glorify Jesus. Okay? Now, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Listen, it's big and small ways in our lives, okay? It is to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. We need to be empowered for all kinds of things. Empowered to have the courage and the boldness to be a witness to other people in specific situations. How about empowered to have the courage to go back to our wife and say, I'm sorry, I blew it, will you forgive me? Right? We need to be empowered to speak the gospel to our neighbor. We need to be empowered to actually have the desire to want to get into the Word on Tuesday morning, right? We need to be empowered to suffer maybe for the the mission, the cause of Jesus Christ in moments, okay? To be filled means to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to defeat temptation in the moment and, and to see our sin and to kill it in the moment, right? It means to value Jesus for who he is and see him and, 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 to, and to act in love like Jesus Christ does in the moment. That's the fruit of the Spirit, right? And so my question is, how many moments of those do you think we should expect in our life as Christians? Two, one, 15, 30? A lot, all the time, right? Like, it should be obvious that we should expect to be filled by the Holy Spirit, over and over and over again, right? Acts chapter 2, Peter is filled right here. That's what the the language says. And then in Acts chapter 4, verse 8, he's filled again. Acts chapter 4, verse 31, he's filled again. Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 13, he's filled again and again and again. And I'm pretty sure that's why Paul uses the words that we're to walk with the Spirit, right? Because we're supposed to have this ongoing relationship with God where we're dependent on Him. Because in our sinful nature, we don't have any power. We can't do anything in our own strength that glorifies Jesus. Okay? That's the truth of the matter. And so here's what this means for you and I as a Christian. It means for us that there should be times that we should be listening to the Holy Spirit. Did you know that? That There should be some times that we are yielding ourselves to him. Times that we're seeking and expecting to become aware of or to experience the work of the Holy Spirit in a way that you haven't in the normalcy of other moments in life. For example, when suffering comes or when temptation comes or, I don't know, when you have opportunities to engage other people and be on mission with the love of Christ and the gospel. Like, in order to not simply live out of our 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 flesh, our natural broken tendencies in those moments, we need to consciously have a relationship with God, the Holy Spirit, and we need to ask with the right motives to be filled. And and he's not obligated, but he is free to empower us in those moments. Being clothed with power means that we should expect and anticipate and desire times and moments where God, by his grace, will heighten our awareness of how incredible and awesome he is times that he will increase our affection for him, maybe even be overcome, times that he would use us in powerful ways outside the norm. Those experiences are to be sought after, but not manipulated, right? Because God's not our genie. We don't decide when the Holy Spirit moves. He's free. He's like the wind, right? So number one, we don't command this power, right? But number two, we hit on this last week, the Holy Spirit doesn't empower us to accomplish our mission or to rob glory from Jesus, does he? He empowers us. We've got to stay anchored to the reason why we should be asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit, why we should be, want to be clothed with power from on high. The purpose is clear. People who are, uh, uh, Acts 1 verse 8, that we would be witnesses of how incredible and awesome Jesus is, right? The entire ministry of the Holy Spirit is rooted in his desire to exalt Jesus Christ, 
and not for us to exalt us. Not to exalt the Holy Spirit and what you can get from him above Jesus. Right? They were all filled, uh, Luke says in, in verse 4, all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in different tongues or languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now, speaking in tongues has been known to cause conflict and confusion in the church. And so I'm going to try to clarify this as simple as I can. If I could summarize it, when the Bible speaks about tongues, it does in two primary ways. One that's for private edification and encouragement, and one that's for public gospel mission. Now, there's a difference with what's happening here at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. These are tongues that are actually known earthly languages that have been gifted by the Holy Spirit to cross barriers with the gospel. There's a difference between that and what we find in other places in the New Testament where there are a gift of tongues that are a spiritual or a heavenly language, oftentimes referred to as a prayer language. So in Acts 2, I mean, these disciples, they love Jesus, like they're surrounded by people who haven't yet heard the good news about Jesus, and they speak different languages. And so the Holy Spirit allows the people who do know Jesus to talk to the people who don't know Jesus so that they can have an opportunity to come and meet Jesus, right? Pretty obvious. So what we have here is God overcoming the Tower of Babel situation, if you remember what that story was about. And what it foreshadows is the day that Revelation 7 that John wrote about when he says that the kingdom of God, when it comes, we will be gathered around the throne of Jesus. People from every tribe, language, and tongue will be singing his praises together, right? Language barriers will be overcome. And I guess a question would, we could ask out of, uh, out of this would be this. Should we, should we expect that this sort of thing still happens today? Do people still experience the gift of the Holy Spirit to supernaturally overcome language barriers? That's a great question. Some will say yes, others will say no. We'll talk more about it later. <laughs> we will. We'll actually talk about it next week. We're going to spend a whole week next week on this. The commotion of Pentecost didn't go unnoticed, Okay. Uh, The rumors spread fast, the crowds gather. At some point, Peter positioned himself in a place to be heard among the crowd, and he raised his voice to give an explanation, okay? What's going on here, Peter? You guys all been drinking too much? Peter stands up and he says, Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed to them, fellow Jews and all you residents of Jerusalem, let me explain this to you and pay attention to my words, for these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. Bible's full of humor, right? (laughs) That is kind of funny. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel, and it will be in the last days. Now, this is important. The last days declared by the prophets, we understand that they are the days that began with the coming of Jesus and God's purpose in the last days is to empower his people again and again with extraordinary outpourings of the Spirit so that we can witness to his name until that witness has reached to all nations to the end of the earth, and then Jesus comes again. And so he says, it it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all people. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my servants in those days, both men and women, and they will prophesy. That sounds like good stuff. Here comes the scary stuff, verse 19. I will display wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below blood and fire and a cloud of smoke the sun will be turned to darkness the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the lord comes well okay so those are signs of disaster and bloodshed and catastrophe that are yet to come right and when the last days are over these last days that we're living in the day of the lord comes jesus returns to judge the living and the dead but here's the here's the invitation verse 21 then in these days in these last days Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Years after this, Peter wrote a, a letter, Second Peter uh, one twenty one. He, he writes that the Old Testament prophets, both men and women, that they never spoke on their own authority or they didn't share their, their personal opinions, but they delivered the message that God himself gave them. And the Bible isn't clear on how, exactly how God did that. Like there are instances in which he speaks to them and reveals his will audibly or internally or through visions and dreams. But on Pentecost, this day, it had been 400 years of relative silence. There were no prophets of Israel recorded for four centuries until John the Baptist shows up and sets the stage for Jesus and what the Holy Spirit was about to do. 
And Peter gets up in the crowd and he explains that what, you, hey guys, what you see happening right now is exactly what God's promised. It's what you've heard from our ancestors. It's exactly what you've been waiting to happen for generations. God declared through the prophet, through the mouth of Joel, that in the last days he'd pour out his spirit on all people, on us. And the evidence would be that all true believers are empowered by the spirit of God to speak the word of God to the people of God. So unlike this in the Old Testament, the, spirit, uh, the more limited exercise of proph- prophecy, they were witnessing a new move of the Spirit and the beginning of the fulfillment of God's work. You have 120 Jewish men and women empowered by the Holy Spirit. Verse 11 says they were proclaiming the mighty works of God. They're declaring the truths of the gospel. It's the dawning of a new age. The last days are here and we are living in them. And God is bringing his plan of redemption to completion. And the invitation is, verse 21, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Next week, we're going to spend a little more time in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. We'll talk more about the spiritual gifts, including what theologians call the sign gifts, tongues, prophecy, healing. We'll ask the questions of whether their gifts, these gifts are for today. Should we pursue them? What's their purpose? How should they be used? But for today, let me just start with this, okay? There are brothers and sisters who hold the view that the prophecy that Joel wrote about and that the Holy Spirit unleashed here Uh, in the New Testament, functions the same way as it did in the Old Testament. They'll say that, you know, it carries the same authority from God and infallibility of, of, you know, the words written in Isaiah. So basically, uh, if they were to embrace that that kind of prophecy continued to happen today, well, then Scripture is not enough. Scripture is insufficient, they would say. So, So that can't be true. So what they conclude then is that the gift of prophecy ceased when the last apostle died. Or they'll say, uh, the gift of prophecy ceased when the last book of the Bible was inspired. Okay? Other Christians today hold the view that the prophecy that Joel wrote about and that the Holy Spirit unleashed brought about some changes in the New Testament. Okay? God was doing a new thing. And the kind of prophecy in these last days don't carry the same authority or infallibility as the Old Testament prophets. It didn't cease with the last apostle or the completion of the Bible. Rather, the New Testament talks about Believers needing to test prophecy or to sift prophecy. That's 1 Thessalonians 5. And we'll get into more of that next week. What Peter seems to be explaining here in Acts 2 would be this declaration that, that it was the dawning of a new age in which the gifts of the Holy Spirit were now present in the life of all believers. And there's two main views. If we want to articulate this today, and with all the sign gifts, there's two main views regarding the gifts that God the Holy Spirit gives to believers. The first is continuationism. And that's the belief that since the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the spiritual gifts have continued to this present day, including the sign gifts. Cessationism, on the other hand, is the view, the belief that certain spiritual gifts, the sign gifts, including prophecy, tongues, healing, that's ceased. But yet other spiritual gifts teaching, administration, preaching, generosity, faith, those have remained. Now, I believe that you've got to do some real theological gymnastics in order to hold a cessationist view, okay? Those who hold that view will point to a passage in 1 Corinthians 13, where the Apostle Paul talks about some of the spiritual gifts that, like, will pass away because we're not going to need them in heaven, right? But love will continue forever, right? So, so like, you read Paul say, uh, love never ends, right? But as for prophecies, he says, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will come to an end. They will cease. As for knowledge, the gift of knowledge, it will come to an end. So, yes, we would all agree, we should all agree, there's an expiration date on some of the spiritual gifts. But when is that? Right? When is that? Well, let's read, keep reading what the Holy Spirit wrote. Verse 9, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. So the main argument for cessation, cessationism is that the perfect is the Scripture. Now that we have the perfect Word of God, they will say we don't need the supernatural, miraculous sign gifts of the Spirit. Now, Calvary had asked, do we believe that the Word of God is perfect? Yes. We do, absolutely. But the perfect that is spoken of right there is not the conclusion of the writing of the Bible. Okay? If we keep reading, you'll see in verse 12, 
Paul continues, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror we see indirectly, but then we're, we're going to see face to face. And so the perfect has a face. And when the perfect comes, we're going to see face to face. And so who are we talking about, right? There's only one perfect guy, right? Let's all say his name. Jesus, Jesus right. So that's him, right? Now, I appreciate how Craig Keener wrote this in his commentary on Acts. He says this. He said, Luke believes that the active intervening God of Israel's earlier scripture is even more active in his day after Pentecost and that the believers continue to live in this biblical era. Luke does not envision that the spirit poured out at Pentecost will be poured back. Okay, The outpouring is for the last days. The spirit remains active since the day of Pentecost and the signs and wonders activity Depicted in Acts should be normative for the entire duration of the church's mission until Jesus returns. Okay? So what, what does that mean? So what, Josh? Like, what, what does that mean for me sitting in here today? Well, maybe it's just this. Maybe it's just this. That the Holy Spirit wasn't poured out simply so that you would be convicted of your sin and turn to Jesus for eternal life only. The Holy Spirit wasn't even poured out simply to empower you to know the Bible or to grow to be more like Jesus. The Holy Spirit was also poured out to walk with you in an ongoing relationship of dependence and to supernaturally empower you for ministry, right? To, to build up your brothers and sisters in Christ and for the mission that God has called you to do. So these are not things that we're going to be able to do naturally, in our own strength or wisdom or power. You can try all you want, but the Spirit gives life. The flesh is of no use at all. Some people prefer to say that they're open to the supernatural gifts of the Spirit, but they're cautious, right? Open but cautious. Anybody heard that view? Okay. I can understand that we would have that as a human tendency, especially because there are a lot of people out there who are abusing or faking the gifts of the Holy Spirit to exalt themselves and not Jesus. Okay, but and, and, and you're afraid, you know, if we go this route and you're talking about supernatural gifts, we're going to be rolling on the floor, barking like dogs and baptizing cats before too long. I get it. I understand the fear. Okay, but the problem with being cautious is this. I don't see it anywhere in here in the New Testament. I don't see it. I, I don't nowhere in does the Bible tell me to be cautious when it comes to pursuing the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It does. It, it tells me to pursue them. It tells me to seek them, and the word that it does use is this. It uses the word discerning, right? It's a gift of the Holy Spirit, right? Discernment is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Cause, to be cautious is not. There's a difference, okay? And so we're going to talk more about this next week, and what, you know, this was kind of a primer and a lot of theological connections. I appreciate you hanging in there with me this Sunday. Uh, more on the gifts of the Holy Spirit next week, but uh, let's just... Uh, pray together this morning and ask God uh, to take these words that we talked about this morning and make them real to us.